All right, thank you guys for coming. Uh, my name is Albert Chen. I'm a system engineer from SwissStack. And I'm Adam Tokvam, another systems engineer from SwissStack. So we're here to talk about Swift 101 today. Um, it's a new breed of storage system that we're working with, so hope you guys enjoy. So a quick overview of what the agenda is. Uh, I'm going to go over what object is quickly, uh, why to use Swift, and what are the different components of Swift. And then Adam will go over a couple use, use cases to give you an idea what it's used for. So what is an object? Well, an object uh, consists of a piece of data plus its metadata. So here's a picture I took of the bamboo forest on my uh, trip to visit Japan back in 2013. So you can see, uh, along with the file name, which is a very long file name I have, uh, it has the size of the picture, the date taken, the uh, extra tags I attached to it, and plus a GPS, GPS location from my phone. All these information combined with the actual picture itself makes up for an object. So, but why Swift? So what makes Swift different than traditional object storage, or not even object storages, but just traditional storage systems in general? One of the things that we traditionally associate with storage is the way that we access it. How do we ingest and consume data from that storage repository? So we're familiar with SIF shares, NFS shares, LUNs, and all these various technologies that are used to access data. Some of the limitations of that, though, is that there is a limited scope that you can access that data from. It's usually accessible from within the enterprise or within the organization and not much outside of your own boundaries. So Swift, by uh, its native interface, is HTTP. So by speaking the language of the internet, it does exactly what you would think. And it can expose your data to various devices and endpoints that are both in your organization and anywhere on the internet. So that changes the radius of, that you can uh, access and influence that data. The other big difference is that Swift is a pure, a pure software-based solution. So it is, uh, as opposed to a hardware-based appliance, being software gives you the flexibility to be able to choose the hardware that you want to run it on and to be able to scale out that hardware at I any arbitrary increment. So you're not locked into having to scale by particular uh, racks or, or uh, even keep the same exact configuration. You know, as new things come out, you can start to scale into those things as well. Um, other big points about it are the ability to be able to define uh, uh, policies without getting into it too much. The ability to have durability through erasure codes or through replicas gives an additional level of uh, availability for that data. Uh, Let's take a look at that in more detail. Yeah, so Swift uh, is consists of four different pieces of service. So I'll go over that in just one second. But the first things I want to talk about is data consistency. And I'm going to try to do this without tripping up my own tongue. So the traditional storage system you're most likely used to are usually strictly consistent. And what that means is when you write a piece of data out and it needs to write to multiple locations, all of those locations will have to be completed successfully for the write to be completed. And if there's an error in one of the locations writing to, then the entire write operation is considered failed. So that's what uh, block file storage is, is usually consist of. Now, eventually consistent system are what is slightly different. Uh, what that means is when you initiate a write, multiple copies will be written out simultaneously. Now, if there are five, uh, th uh, three pieces of write happening and two of them completed, which is more than half of the writes, the write is considered okay. Uh, if that, that last piece did not complete, the system will um, redo, redo that write asynchronously afterwards. So you don't need to wait for all three pieces to complete. For example, if that third data center you have is having a network outage or the disk drive it's trying to write to, uh, is having a bad disk and needs to be replaced. Uh, the system will self-heal at the end of the day. Uh, there are some limitations to uh, strictly consistent and eventual consistent systems, depending on what your use case is and what your scalability is. So we've listed those out uh, on, on the slides. Okay, so now that we got the consistency piece out of the way, let's go on to the different services. 
The first one I'm going to touch on is called proxy service. Uh, this service is responsible for directing all the incoming HTTP API traffic. Uh, and it's going to direct that right to part of the cluster. How does it know where to send those writes? Well, it will take, uh, it will compute the hash of the incoming object's file path and take that value and it will use that value to figure out where that write will be located on where that service is on the back end. So if you have a 100 storage node, it will take the incoming file path and then it will figure out, oh, it's going to be stored on node 10, 17, and 25. So Swift will do its best to spread out the write in a um, as uniquely as possible type of situation. And what that means is I'm going to take, if I had to write three copies, for example, if I only have one hard drive, it's going to write it to three different locations on the hard drive. If I have three different hard drives, it's going to write it to three different hard drives. So on and so forth. Uh, if I have three servers, it's going to spread them among the different servers. And then if I have three different geolocations, it'll spread it among the different locations as much as possible. And the idea is so you'll get better durability in case you have a drive failure, a server outage, um, WAN disconnections. Uh, the proxy service is considered stateless. So if you want to increase your performance, you will just add additional uh, proxy servers. So you have more parallel worker that could process the incoming request for read and write. Okay. The next one is the accounts and containers service. The account service is responsible for the account's metadata, such as username, permissions, and it has a listing of the containers that's owned by this account. And there's also the container service, which contains the container metadata, uh, has the listing of the objects underneath, and the storage policy, such as replicas or erasure codes. Um, we usually combine these services together because they're very similar. Um, we deploy them in, uh, on SSDs. And part of the reason is because when you have an incoming request, uh, all the requests will need to touch on these accounts and uh, container uh, service to know where, if you have the rights to read these containers, uh, what objects in the container, and where the objects are. And then before it could go and retrieve that object. So it's, it's think about it as an indexing service. Uh, you would increase the number of accounts and container if you have a large number of objects stored, or you have a lot of users, and you have a lot of uh, frequent accesses. So, um, and you just add additional services to them. We will also deploy these on SSDs to give you a faster response. Uh, you could put them on spinning disk, but given the cost of SSD and how much space it actually use, we generally uh, provide a, a disk per two uh, per, per one of the services nodes. Then we have, last but not least, but the object server. So the object service is responsible for storing your payload. So uh, if you saw example earlier, my picture would actually be stored in the object server. This is where all the disk will be. It will usually consist of a large amount of hard drives. Um, the metadata for the object will also be stored in the object service as well. And there are two other subservices I would like to let you know that's running on that. One is called the replication service. It is job is to be responsible for making sure you have enough copies of the good data. Uh, if it find out that you have a policy to store three copies of this, this picture, but it can only find two because one has been replaced or been corrupted, it will put it into the queue and replicate another copy to another location. So that, that uh, service is called the replication service. There's also the auditing service that work with the replication service. Its job is to find data in your system that's not, uh, that's been corrupted and has been modified um, unwillingly. So its job is to look through all the data and then flag anything that's unusual, check it with the incoming sum, the, the checksum that we have written when the data was first ingested into your cluster and do a comparison. If that does not match, it will quarantine this piece of data and said to the replication service, hey, this piece of data is bad. Uh, get me another copy from another location. Uh, the most uh, general scaling out use case is when you need more storage or if you, uh, you, you run out of space, okay, well, you add additional st object storage uh, services in, in your system, usually by adding additional disks as well. 
OK, so Adam will cover the next part. All right. So, uh, so what do we do with an eventually consistent object store? Uh, we want to examine a few different use cases of uh, specific implementations that people have done and some common things that we run into out in the field. Uh, first among them is backup. Um, I, I know everyone here uh, backs up their data. This is where I give that, that glance at everyone, right? You, you, everyone backs up their data, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so we have a number of partners that are mentioned at the bottom, as well as uh, 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 two different primary cases in which we see this. One is uh, enterprise backup scenarios, so you're uh, backing up the various workstations within an enterprise, or in a managed service provider context where you're actually providing a cloud backup service for customers. And in either case, you can, uh, you can leverage uh, an object storage in a, uh, to do really two things. One is you want to be able to have a very high throughput. So as he was mentioning, the ability to be able to scale out the proxies becomes very helpful, especially in the MSP scenario if you've got a lot of different uh, endpoints that are backing up at the same time. And then also uh, having the ability to, um, to have the, those rights optimized so that they are uh, they're coming in with, again, sort of, again, re, re, uh, Re-emphasizing his point around the eventual consistency, having the, the rights more guaranteed reduces the number of retries, which obviously improves the number of successes and, and decreases the overall throughput necessary. So I give a, a couple of examples here of some specific high-density configurations. Uh, we've provided those just for reference if uh, you're interested. Another, uh, another use case, this is one that we get asked about a lot. This is one, um, so uh, big data slash MapReduce. So this is where um, customers come to us and they say, well, you know, we, we, of course, we have HDFS that's being used as the underlying file system for Hadoop, and it's starting to grow, and it's starting to grow, and it's starting to grow. Well, why is it starting to grow? Well, it's starting to grow because we're storing all this, this warm data and this cold data is just over time starting to accumulate on HDFS. And, well, it provides replication. It has some, you know, data durability guarantees, but as we begin to continue to scale this out, first of all, it is strictly consistent. So then going back to that earlier conversation, and then uh, it's not really what it was made for, right? I mean, HDFS was meant to be a really good file system for being able to very quickly deliver data where you need it. And it's really that data locality property that's what makes HDFS unique. So let's let it do that, right? Let's let it do what it does best. And then for once that we have the data that's already computed and, and put out, then let's put that over into an archive tier like a Swift. Swift then gives you the ability to store that data with all the guarantees and durability that comes along with it, as well as being able to have a centralized repository for all sorts of kinds of data. So as you're trying to share those results with other different uh, departments within the organization, you have the one place that everybody knows to go to, whereas HDFS doesn't really provide that same type of, of capabilities. And, uh, and also what it allows you to do is just shrink the HDFS down. It doesn't ever fully remove it because you're going to need it for, you know, for the internals of what that MapReduce job is doing. But having it as an uh, import-export relationship is really sort of what, what we're shooting for in this scenario. So at the very last, I, I included a link to the Hadoop OpenStack uh, project. It was sort of formerly known as SwiftFS. And what it does is it's actually uh, part of the Hadoop project now. And it, it provides an interface where you can literally just natively go in and pull data right out of Swift, bring it into uh, to a Hadoop job, do your processing, and then when you're done, archive it back out. Media and entertainment. So this is a fun one because it really, it, it highlights some, some very interesting capabilities inside of Swift. So the first part of it is the media encoding and ingest. Now this is one that, uh, sorry, I stepped out a little bit of Swift uh, uh, specifically and mentioned a, a piece of middleware called Storlets that was developed by IBM. And so what media and entertainment companies need to do is they have to have a way to be able to, first of all, get unencoded me uh, media into their file system, but then they also need to encode it into various formats. So having the ability to be able to manipulate objects on the fly as they're being either read into or written into or read out of the object storage system would be really useful. And so that's where this piece of middleware comes into play where um, 
it will basically give you the ability to trigger on, an, on objects as they're coming in and out of the system. So they can say, well, whenever we're going to put in a new, uh, you know, movie of, of whatever it is right in a raw format, then we want to automatically kick off encoders that are going to go in and, and write in the various formats and then write those back. So that sort of thing is now becoming possible. This is really on the very cutting edge of, of uh, things that are available uh, within the Swift community. And content streaming. Content streaming is, of course, very important. Being able to stream, if you have a 100 gigabyte movie uncompressed, let's say, being able to stream that back out to, to users and not have to have them buffer the entire thing and play it is, is key. And that's uh, intrinsic to what Swift does. There's absolutely nothing we have to do to support that. Um, large objects. So one of the limitations of an object storage system is that the object is the unit that we look at as far as the, the minimum amount of stuff we can move around. We're not, we're not block storage, so we don't break it into blocks. We keep it as a unit. So we put a five gigabyte limit, which is the same as Amazon S3, on the size of an object. So when these objects are, are routinely larger than that, then what often we see customers do is rather than break it up like at the five gigabyte limit and then start another five gig segment and so on and so forth, which you could do, the other option that they often go for is to break it up according to minutes or, or seconds in this case, usually 15 seconds or 30 second increments. Because by doing that, then that gives them the flexibility to be able to, after the fact, modify that stream. So they could then go back and modify the manifest that's created. So maybe I need to step back a minute. And <laughs> it's, um, so when each of those different uh, parts are uploaded, there has to be a manifest file that says these are the parts that comprise this larger object. So then going back and being able to, to modify that so we can play with the manifest a little bit and say, well, let's insert a couple of objects here at this particular point in time and a couple of over here, and now we've added commercials to the movie for better or for worse, right? And so it's a, it's a way to also be able to modify and, and manage your data uh, in Swift without having to make copies, especially not personalized copies for every user. Life sciences. So this is one where uh, Swift is gaining a lot of traction as a content repository. It's it's not that the use case is incredibly unique. You can imagine a lot of different uh, applications for this where you have a lot of large files that need to be shared with a lot of people. But um, in particular, some of the unique things that they do have are that there's a lot of laboratory instruments that are running. So these could be gene sequencers or mass spectrometers or a variety of different, any types of sensors or, or things that are gathering samples uploading that data into Swift. And so there's a large concurrency requirement that needs a very large throughput to be able to handle all of that data that's coming in and then have the durability requirements, the ability to spread that data across multiple regions, then also gives the uh, life sciences community really everything they need to be able to you know, read their data in, process it, and then publish those results uh, all within one place, which uh, which again keeps coming back to the same theme of that one common centralized repository. All right, so some of the qu questions that you might be asking is, this sounds pretty cool. Uh, what is it gonna take me to get a Swift cluster up and running? So I'm gonna talk about the, the hardware a little bit. So what kind of hardware does Swift run on? Um, as you can see here, these are not brand name hardware. It's just x86 hardware. Uh, the support requirement is um, Ubuntu CentOS, as long as the operating system supports the system that you're dealing with underneath, um, that's all we need and, and be able to see. Uh, obviously, you have to be able to present a uh, driver for disks, a uh, driver for networking adapters, and w or whatever connectivity that you choose to, to run through. So, as you see the logo on the right, we work with pretty much anybody, and we've got customer for pretty much all of them. Um, depending on who you are mostly uh, working with, who you're familiar with, uh, who is your prefer preferred vendor. So I'll give you an example. This year, I may be getting a very good deal from HP. They're having a sale. I like their sales guys. Um, next year, they're like, oh, Albert, your, your discount is only last year. I can't do it this year again. Well, I can go and talk to Supermicro and, or Cisco and say, hey, you know, can you give me a good deal this year? And I could mix the different type of hardware together. Um, Swift will figure out how to put all those weighting into calculations and store the data evenly. Uh, 
We have put in on the slides here a couple of general purpose servers. Some of them have 60 bays, 36 bays drives, and 62 bay drives. Uh, the UCS uh, server is actually two nodes compute, uh, combined into one. So depending on what your work workloads are, uh, you could pick the number of disks, uh, number of disks per server. But as for our recommended three copy minimum, we usually ask you to have three, if not four or more location to put that data. So Swift can satisfy is uh, as uniquely as possible locations. Uh, if you have a backup archive, you'll say, hey, well, I don't need that much compute power on retrieving this data. I can, I can wait another two seconds for my data to be retrieved. Uh, we got even denser solutions from 60 drive to 84 drive to 90 drives per box. Um, 90 drive, what, were eight terabyte? 720 well, terabyte. It's, it's very new. That's, that's, that's the server Dell announced last week, so they're yeah. very proud of it. So we're, we're, we'll give them, uh, <laughs> we'll help them amplify that signal a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so you can get 720 terabyte raw per box times that by three, that's several petabytes. So depending on what your use case, and I think Swift works best when you're dealing with large quantity of data. I'm not talking about five terabyte, 10 terabyte, because that runs on two disks. Uh, we're talking about minimally 50 plus to 100, to 500, to a petabyte, to multi-petabyte range scales. Um, be being software only, it scales quite well on uh, whatever hardware you give it, um, but it's, it's meant to play in the larger side of things. Okay, so uh, as, again, my name's Albert Chen. I work for SwissStack, and this is Adam. We're both from SwissStack here uh, telling you about Swift. And we also have a couple other sessions coming up in the next couple of days. So please feel free to come and visit them. Um, I'll put this back later. But being this is a Swift session, you said, hey, this sounds good. I want to know more. Uh, we have links on um, give you detailed guides and, and overviews to if you want to find out more information. There is also on OpenStack itself, there's a Swift all-in-one step-by-step guide on deploying how to, uh, how to deploy Swift itself. Um, that's a good practice if you want to find out what it takes to, to deploy Swift and do all the calculation by hand. Um, it's written by John Dickinson, our, one of the Swift Stack employees. Um, there's API if you're a developer. Um, for a contributor, there's also access to IRC. Um, now, if you want to try a Swiss stack product and find out what the difference is, I also have a link up there for the free trial. Uh, I see w a couple of you guys have books out from, from Swiss. So that's the, the book written by Joe Arnold, our, um, what's his title? Product? He's the chief product officer. Chief product officer. Mm -hmm. So he will be doing a signing and giveaway free books tomorrow at uh, 1045 to 1115 at booth T41. Come by if you want a copy. <laughs> it gives you a very detailed, uh, a good read on what Swift is. So if you want to find out more, come grab a free copy of books. And um, is there any more? Thank you very much for, for coming. And if you've got questions, now would be the time to put your hand up. So, so you talked about the hardware oh. uh, We'll grab you a mic so everybody can hear. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you talked about the hardware requirement. Is yes. there any DRAM requirement for the size? If I want to implement a Swift on a 10 terabyte, what is the DRAM requirement? Uh, for no. 10 terabyte? Yeah. For that size, I probably would suggest you run it on virtual machines. Generally, Swift needs access to bare metal. For trial purposes, what we find is people can spin up a virtual machine quite easily. Uh, two virtual CPU, four gigs of RAM. Uh, now, if you're going a little bit bigger, I would say four vCPUs, eight gigs of RAM, and you have a couple of nodes, and you can run those in for, for functionality testing. But if you're doing any sort of production environment, make sure you put it on hardware. Um, part of the reason Swift is, is designed for failure, and what that means is it needs to know when things are not working properly. Either it's networking, or disk, or the entire box is not responding. Virtualizing it in a virtual machine, running it through RAID controller, uh, will actually remove that ability to see it. So we say, run it on bare metal if you're going to do it in production. Uh, do not run it through RAID controller. And there's a whole ar article online to say why, but the short of it is we need to know when a drive is broken. I think generally speaking to the memory usage, and maybe this is some of what you're getting at is maybe caching, you know, caching requirements, things like that. There is no caching inside of Swift. 
So, so the memory requirements you'll find are very modest. Uh, there, there is a certain minimum requirement by the XFS file system that underlies it. Mm -hmm. So it, it has a, a need to be able to cache inodes, which are, you know, as you know, are extremely small. So if you had a really large number of objects, if we started talking about billions of objects, then I would start to really care about your memory and, and if we're going to have, you know, I, uh, inode faults and things like that, which, which in and of themselves are fine too. If that happens, it just means it has to pull it off disk instead of having it in memory. It's not a big deal. Um, but yeah, that's really it, you know? So beyond that, there, there's not a lot driving a really high memory requirement on anything in Swift. Uh, real quick, what is it that Swift Stack brings to Swift that's not there already? Well, Swift Stack is a company that was built around uh, uh, OpenStack Swift. Uh, and what, uh, really, we're bringing two things into the picture. One is the ability to easily manage the deployment and configuration of a Swift Stack, uh, of a OpenStack Swift cluster, fundamentally and then also gather statistics back about that cluster. So we're continuously gathering metrics, not just CPU and memory, but also how are each of the nodes doing, the health of the services, uh, you know, are we starting to fill up the disk, all these sorts of things. And so we provide a series of metrics along with thresholds for each of those metrics so that you don't have to basically do all that work yourself and figure out what's important to an object store and what isn't, what's indicative of a failure or a failure about to come. What, you know, how do we know that we're about to, to, to encounter something? So we handle all of that and then if any of those thresholds are exceeded, an SNMP trap is sent and then that can be sent to you know, a centralized monitoring solution. I think there's one other one that Adam missed. It's when things are not working, I have a phone number to call and there'll be a person on the other You're side right. to help me with it. <laughs> uh, a lot of time what we find with open source project is that it's a very powerful engine, but that's all that is, is an engine. For, it, for me to actually use it, I have to know every little thing about it. I have to be in the chat group, I have to be in the R IRC, I have to contribute patches, I have to be in the weeds of things, I have to know everybody to get this, to feel comfortable to deploy this in an enterprise environment. But not every administrator have this t uh, amount of time or energy, not every company can dedicate multiple headcounts to develop their own open source cluster. And what happens if that person leaves one day and says, I want to go do a better, do a, find a different job. What happened to your production environment? Do you feel comfortable doing that? No. So our job is to say we're here to provide you a source of comfort. So when you have your environment up and running and you need to call somebody and say, hey, my cluster is doing something funny. It's, can you help me figure out what this means or help me figure out how to write my application to take advantage of this cluster? We are able to do that for you. But um, I think it's very important for us to be here in the community and tell you what the product, what the engine is about. And if you want to know more of what we do, uh, we provide the steering wheel, we provide the wheel, we provide the seat you sit into to make this car drivable uh, for, for your environment. Okay, um, so I do have a question for the audience. Does, can you guys put your hand up if this is the first time you've heard about Swift or object storage? Hands up. <laughs> That's what I figured. You guys, you guys, <laughs> mostly you guys are all veterans. So you guys know what, what object storage is. Okay, that's kind of interesting. So, oh, no, no, uh, it's, it's a survey, so. Um, if you guys have any question, uh, Adam and I will be here afterwards to help you answer them. Um, I also have a demo for a Swiss stack I can run and, and show you guys after, after the session outside to see what our product does. But um, if you have any question, please feel free to come up to us and come and say hi. I can. In two minutes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, give me one sec, though. Hold on to this. Mm -hmm. Designated cord holder. Wait. Uh, is my internet fast enough for this? Yeah. So I I don't have a uh, I don't have a re uh, source running on my machine. So this will take a little bit of time to do, um, but once the once the uh, the installation starts to happen, you can kind of get an idea of what what uh, the system will kind of look like.
Don't wait, hang on. So one of the key things that he's going to show here in just a moment is about <laughs> is around the controller. So the controller node is one that we haven't talked about it, uh, previously in this talk because this was an OpenStack Swift talk. So we really tried to keep the Swift stack thing stuff to an absolute minimum, but uh, but Swift stack does make a controller. It is an entire uh, entirely closed source product that uh, that we provide. That is what does this centralized management, administration, and monitoring of the cluster, and it also works uh, to manage the ingestion of nodes. That's the terminology that we use. To ingest a node is to configure it with Swift and bring it into your cluster. And so, uh, so that process is really very straightforward. Uh, once you have a, a, a server that's set up, uh, like any of the ones that we mentioned in the hardware section, the only requirement is that you have either uh, the latest version of CentOS or uh, Ubuntu or uh, Red Hat installed. Uh, we actually request a minimal installation. We don't need any really other prerequisites other than just having access to the storage itself, having access to the network, and having the network configured appropriately. Uh, beyond that, it's a matter of running a, uh, a curl command to then download a script. The script runs, and it'll install a series of packages that we provide uh, that comes from your controller. So your controller also acts as a, sort of a package repository for being able to push out versions of Swift and Swift stack out to the cluster. Okay, so what I have here is a Ubuntu node. Um, it's got the basic IP address configured, uh, host name, and that's about it. There's no Swift service installed. Um, it's basically empty. So what Adam said earlier is, you're right, you initialize the installation by running a curl command towards the controller, uh, which is a uh, Swift stack product. And it's going to pull down this set of commands for you. And this set of commands will basically say, OK, well, do a test on the node. And then it's going to download all these packages for you automatically. OK, I'm going to pipe this to Bash. And hopefully, my internet is fast. Well, I'm crossing my fingers right now. Mm -hmm. So what you see on the screen right now is going through the installation process to pull down the different package dependency that it needs. It's going to go and do an installation uh, and then configure these packages so the node will be done. This is all done automatically. Um, one of the things you're going to put up your hand and say, yeah, I can do this myself too. Yeah, you can. Uh, but the thing is, you got to think about every single update you do, you have to go and make sure you update your dependency. New operating system comes out, new version of Python comes out, you're going to go and check all that. You can do that, or we can do that. It's up to you. Right. One major part of that people overlook is what to do in the event of a failure. I mean, so deployment is one thing, ongoing administration is another. So if you have a failed disk, what do you do? I mean, with Swift, uh, with the OpenStack Swift product, well, you have options, but you're going to have to manually do something. You're going to have to go and remove that drive from the ring, repush the ring out, or replace the drive and have it rebuilt. Those are kind of your two options. With Swift Stack, you don't have to really worry about that. It will recognize that the drive has failed. It will automatically push the ring because that's your configuration and then you'll see the cluster rebalance and nobody has to get up at 2 o'clock in the morning. Ooh, I don't want to wake up at 2 in the morning. Yeah, I don't either. I hardly I'm go to sleep by 2 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so while that is doing the installation right now, I'm going to switch to the controller. So who, uh, the people who have used Swift know that is a very command line based configuration. So this whole web interface that you see here is Swift stack only. Um, basically, it will give me a good indication of how healthy my cluster is. And I can look through my, uh, my existing nodes. It'll tell me how much data I've stored on it, how, many, uh, how are my rings balanced, how well are they balanced together. Um, I can even look on the server stats. And these are um, different ones, thinking about CPU, memory, usage across the different nodes. And I believe I can also pick up the different uh, nodes to actually look at. I forget to find the buttons. But the Swift stats is also the operational of the Swift. So how much um, throughput I'm getting, what is response time, how long it takes before I get ahead, uh, a, a post request completed. So these are all aggregated, presented to you in a easy to read format that I can track for multiple of weeks or years. Um, these data are all sitting in the controller itself. Uh, there is one very important thing to keep in mind is no actual user data is sent to the controller. Uh, we do the hosting of the controller, but you're only sending back stats uh, for, for your system. No actual customer payload sent back to us. That would be too much data, actually. <laughs> um, 
So then for those are, who are running service provider type of model, if you're providing storage for your different department, you're gonna do chargeback. Uh, we also have a utilization API by accounts uh, to tell you how much to charge everybody per month. Um, this is a GUI interface, but this can be accessed through API as well. And the last part is planning. Um, now that you know how, how much data is being used, you also want to know when you need to add additional uh, storage to your cluster so you don't run to the wall. So we also give you a chart of an, an overall understanding of how utilized your cluster is. So there is no surprise. Check in every now and then to make sure that hasn't gone to, gone to the red part. Okay, I'm gonna look back on my cluster right now. So it has finished that, uh, doing that automated installation right now. So it gave me back a clean URL I'm gonna copy to the browser. Uh, if I can move my mouse far enough. I'm gonna paste this into my browser and it's gonna give me a clean URL. And something to keep in mind is the only thing I've done on this uh, machine through the uh, through the, through the co command console is to type this curl command and that's it and I copy the URL out so if you are not that familiar with Linux or you're still learning about Linux and you're worried about oh can I do this yes you can it's very easy um, makes it quite simple for you to use uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and claim the node it is going to establish a reverse VPN connection what that means is you don't need to open a firewall port out. If you have the standard ports open and outgoing connections are, are allowed, uh, you can basically set up that connection automatically. You don't need to go and ask your network admin to say open port 9550 for me. Um, we don't need to worry about that. So now that communication has been set up, I'm gonna hit claim. And I'm gonna add that extra node to my demo uh, cluster. And I'm, it's gonna ask me, okay, so this is the host name, here's the MAC address. Where would you like to put it? Uh, let's see, I'm gonna put it in Hong Kong for today, just for the fun of it. And I'm gonna say this is gonna run the Swift node. And Swift node is the one that has proxy, account, container, and object services all in one. Uh, for demo purposes, I'm gonna leave it like that. But you have also options of running it, um, such as accounts, container, objects, or the different, uh, different options, such as, uh, proxy objects, so it, the different combinations are endless depending on what you want. This is Swift Stack UI, not integrated into Horizon. Uh, not at this point. It's it's strictly within um, Swift can run very much as a separate standalone product. Uh, so the dashboard is separate, but it will work with OpenStack, other components as well to accept as an object store. Okay, okay. Yeah. It's a question that comes up uh, every now and then, but really, here, here's the real reason, right? The real reason we don't is because the vast majority of people who deploy Swift are not OpenStack uh, customers. Yeah. So we see a lot of uh, Swift being deployed into VMware environments, bare metal environments, anything you can think of. And so uh, maintaining that separation just kind of makes sense. I mean, if there's some easy way to plug it in or something, yeah, sure, you know, we, we could look into that. But, um, but right now, that's sort of the reality of the market. You know, it's fortunately, OpenStack's still treading water against some, uh, some uh, uh, uncertainty in the market. And so, uh, but hopefully we're starting to see that turn around now. I mean, I, th I think we're definitely uh, finding more and more OpenStack deployments. So, uh, so we should start to see some of these integrations get deeper over time. Okay, before I keep going, so uh, just as the time Adam was talking, I just set up the network uh, interfaces. Swift runs on three separate network interfaces. This is the outgoing, which it talks to the application. And then there are two in, uh, internal facing communication, which is does replication and ingest. Um, I can explain that a little bit more, but we separate it out for administrator so they can uh, direct or modulate the traffic depending on their needs. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and manage my drive. Hang on a sec. Here we go. Um, so I also formatted the drive and I'm gonna add all those drives into my storage policies. So. This one's in Hong Kong, so I'm gonna add accounts container multi geo replication reduced. I'm gonna add this to uh, Asia replica, but not anything else. I'm gonna add it to the policies, and I'm gonna add it gradually. What this does is it's gonna do the rebalancing of the ring by itself. Uh, 
when you have a large amount of data, so let's say 500 terabytes, and you add another 500 terabytes of uh, storage space into the system, it's going to migrate approximately 200 to 250 terabytes of data around. If you say immediately, it's going to do that right away and generate a fair amount of traffic on your network that your network admin may not like you very much at that point. So Swift will is suggested the best practice to do that a little portion at a time. But um, I don't really want to do it by hand, so I'm going to ask SwissStack to do that for me. I'm going to hit Enable, and I'm going to enable this node. And I'm going to click on Deploy to deploy that to the rest of the node. And this is going to run. It will take a couple minutes. And that's it for me for deploying another node to my SwissStack cluster. So that's 10 minutes. Any and questions? All of this too can be automated as well. So if you are uh, running, uh, you know, Ansible is, is one that we use in house a lot that we've developed some playbooks for. Also works with Puppet or Chef. Uh, we do have an automation, uh, sort of a plugin for this that we can enable that will allow you to, to use a configuration management utility to run through it. Mm -hmm. Can you say that from again? Heat, it wouldn't be heat directly. Heat would call Puppet, right? And then Puppet would do it. And yes, you could do it from there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, I already see the increased storage. So any other questions? Um, different monitoring. I think I covered the monitoring, the management. So with SwissStack, it still runs on Swift uh, as a object storage engine itself. So it has all the functionality underneath. We just made it easier to use. So you guys support multiple versions of Swift with this? Uh, we usually tell you to upgrade to the latest because you want, yeah, just keeping it to the latest is, is probably the standard. But Yeah, we bundle a version of Swift with each release of Swift stack that comes out every two weeks. And so uh, you really have two options. If you use our hosted controller offering, you'll always get the latest thing all the time. So you won't have to worry about having the controller updated. It's going to be upgraded for you, and you'll always have the latest stuff to be able to run. All you have to do is go and say, all right, I'm ready to pull the latest Swift down onto my nodes uh, on the releases where Swift is actually uh, 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 increased. But um, the, uh, the other option, too, would be to be able to uh, deploy the controller to your uh, on-premises within your, your firewall. Doing that gives you two things. One is the ability to just sort of keep it in-house, be able to manage your own, your own configuration, but it also gives you the flexibility. If you wanted to run an older version or didn't want to take every two-week uh, updates, you could have that option to do so. Okay, so I think we're time. Uh, thank you guys <laughs> for, for, for coming. If you've got questions, we'll be right outside. Thank you. Thank you.